Welcome to the Writing Community Chat Show. It is Wednesday at last. Uh, hello, everybody. Welcome to the Rising Community Chat Show. Uh, we're very excited to make it to Wednesday, as always. And it's a great honor to share that day with you. And weirdly, we only saw you yesterday and some of you are back already. And that's fantastic. So we really appreciate uh, you coming back and tuning in. Hello, Chris. Yeah, hello. Hump day. We've made it to hump day. So yes. yeah, well, congratulate yourself. Give yourself a little pat on the back. Uh, we're halfway there. Yeah, honestly, it does feel like a. Um, there was a hump today in the sense of. Oh, was uh, there? <laughs> yeah, um, but you know, it's. Uh, I'm happy to make it over, and uh, you know, this week's been great, and we've got very exciting things coming in this show, and things are speeding up, Chris, because next week we've got the Harrogate uh, Crime Writers Festival that we're going to. Um, Not next week, we... mate. It's quite a while ago. Quite a while next to month, go. Yeah, next month. Next month. Next month. Um, <laughs> If we can get tickets to, because they're restricting those at the moment. So we'll see what happens with that. You might see us waving from a tent miles away or behind a tent. Somewhere. Yeah. I mean, we've banged on about it for like since we heard about it starting. So uh, it would be so ironic if the last two tickets just went just before we got ours. And they were like, Chris, sorry, boys, you're not coming. You'll see us outside <laughs> and drinking our own little beer cans from the show. And uh, and mm. that'll be it. And it'll be worth the, the video for that. So, but, um, you know. Uh, that's happening. The panel show that is coming next week, guys, uh, next Friday. We're very excited about that as well. Really looking forward yeah, to that. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be good. It's going to be like nothing you've ever seen on YouTube before concerning <laughs> writers and books um, and everyone involved in books as well. So yeah. it's going to be brilliant. So talking about books, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put today's, again, two shows without a beer token. Uh, I know it's... Um, uh, you know, people are very busy, money's tight as well, but it's a great opportunity to promote your book. So we haven't had one today. So we're going to, again, promote the author's, the, the guest book, which is fine. Um, Ant Antolin, is that Antolin? I've uh, been listening Ooh. to the podcast and this is my first live show. Well, hey, uh, welcome to the show. And it's great to see you live. So um, please enjoy the chat there. And they were a crazy bunch. So do enjoy. Uh, so yeah, we'll do uh, our guest book at the top corner right there, Chris. You can see that right now. Ooh. And I will put in the bottom. Oof. Yeah. That is a good cover. I mean, tonight's guest covers for all of his books are just amazing. If you haven't seen them, definitely check them out because they have a thing of beauty. Well, if you look at the text on the bottom, this book has come out this month and it's had 356 reviews already and it's rated 4.8 out of 5, which is exceptional. Um, so Ooh. we're very excited about that. So let's introduce tonight's guest and we can stop waffling. Um, he is the author of many police procedurals, and in 2019, he won the uh, Crime Writers Association Gold Dagger Award for his novel, which is amazing. And in 2020 and 2021, he was nominated for the Long List Award again. Um, so he has also got a fantastic quote on his website that I want to read out because uh, I really liked it. He says, uh, put me in front of a blank screen and the laughter stops immediately replaced by sinister <laughs> thoughts. That definitely works well on our show. So, definitely. ladies and gentlemen... Please welcome M. W. Craven. Hello, Mike. Hello. How are you? We're fantastic. Thank you so so much for joining us. It's uh, it's an honour to have you here. What a wonderful bookshelf behind you as well. Um, that's fantastic. How are you doing? I'm okay, thanks. I'm okay. Yeah. Um, the, the shelf's actually new. Um, it's only been a couple of weeks, so I'm still playing about with it. So the, the bottom shelves are a bit tatty, but you can't see them. So, I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, so here's the question. How how um, structured are you with sorting this out, or are you just kind of throwing books where you kind of feel like it? Well, because, because I, I'd wanted – because, I mean, this is my office. I'm, I'm in here every day, and I work in here every day. And I was, I was quite excited to get fitted, um, uh, floor to ceiling, book, bookcases put in. And so I was terribly excited – um, that's one of the reasons I missed the deadline I was talking about. <laughs> I wasn't paying attention to any emails or anything. Um, so yeah, I, oh, everything stopped when it came and I was sorting the shelves out. And I've got all these little knickknacks that I, I call curiosities. My wife calls absolute tat. Um, <laughs> I, I've been sort of arranging them um, just above oh, that. Yeah, you can see the gold dagger. Um, oh yeah. So. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun, but it's it's surprise. I thought I'd have loads of room, but I yeah. I still I still don't have enough. So I've had to. I've got a cunning plan. I put the paperbacks um, 
on the shelf behind the hardbacks, which has actually saved me a lot of a lot of room. So yeah, it's it's good. It's good fun. It's yeah. Good. So, yeah. So the gold dagger yeah. um, was for the puppet show. Is that that's the book next to it, right? Yes, it is. Yes, yes. That's the original yeah. cover. Um, when they rebranded me, uh, which happened that well, they did the cover for Black Summer. They the uh, they loved the hardback cover, uh, the hardback of it actually. But for the paperback, they wanted something that would appeal across the globe because Little Brown Publishing. Um, all the English speaking world um, in countries apart from the, the States. So they, re they rebranded the paperback um, for Black mm -hmm. Summer and then they retrospectively went back and changed the puppet show. So there's, there's going to be a door in every, in every book mm -hmm. now, I think. Um, which it, it's now being copied, which is uh, by other mm -hmm. author published houses, which is quite, quite flattering, also quite annoying, but um, <laughs> there's nothing, you can't copyright ideas, as you know. So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you'll have to, if you carry on the way you're going, you'll have to get a shelf just for your awards. <laughs> because that um, obviously yeah, takes up a nice big space. That would be nice. I mean, I mean I've mean, i got all my foreign rights um, editions up there, and they take up a lot of space as well. I, I just had the, um, I think it was the Swedish Black Summer came through last week. I was like, oh, I've got no room for it. I've got, I had to <laughs> rearrange like, the entire shelf just to get one book in. Um, well, that, that, that's the very definition of a first world problem, isn't it? Well, you've got yeah. uh, you've got plenty of good competitions on your website. One of which is to, you get a, a nice bottle of uh, gin as well, which I loved. Um, you have to start giving away these uh, copies just because you know oh, there's a great competition here. Not that I'm trying to get <laughs> yeah. rid of these. I, I mean, I, a lot of these competitions I don't know anything about. I just sort of get copied into. Oh, that we're running this competition, that competition. Um, so yeah. I share them, but I also run a lot of my own. Yeah. Um, but. The, the because you get six, I think you're contracted for six copies of each edition of your of your, of your foreign books, um, yeah. author copies, which obviously you'll, you'll know about. The um, so they were stacking up, and, and last year during the second lockdown, I think I was contacted by an organization who, who um, put foreign language books into prisons, like for. Wow. Turkish prisoners and 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 um, particularly Russian and, and and just some of these things. So I was able to get rid of a lot actually, which was quite, which was quite handy. But this, they soon start building up again, and you don't yeah. want to get rid of them all because some of them are quite are quite nice. Although you don't know what to do with them. Um, so just my wife, learn then, more languages, maybe. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. I'm sure my wife will say, do, "Do we have any Japanese friends?" <laughs> we don't know any Japanese people. Um, so yeah, so I it's just something that's. Um, uh, I'll, I mean, I'll I'll cope with um, it, it. It's not a massive problem. It's just um, yeah. I mean, when the pubs reopen again, that's a great icebreaker because you could literally go up to somebody who's fr who you are like, oh they're Russian or oh they're Japanese. Go up to them and just say, "Got this nice book for you." And I was <laughs> yeah. like, no, it was it was it was dead well, dead, dead funny f for me. I found it funny because that's the time I think I thought uh, not so much funny for the hell. My wife um, drink before all this started was having um there's, there's a cafe uh, a sort of coffee house that she likes in carlisle and it was owned by a turk so and we had all these turkish uh, copies so we um or well, she actually uh, just dropped them off and said oh this is for such a, he wasn't he wasn't on shift uh, so this is on this is for um I, I, I don't know his name but this is for when he, when he comes back but apparently in his culture where he's from that's like the same as dropping a horse's head and you're bad to the immortal enemy as a sort of warning that retribution is coming, which I found hysterically funny. But wow. she, she was mortified when she found out. Oh dear! <laughs> Amazing. They never had returned to work. It's like <laughs> I can't go back there. Give me all your. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so so let's let's uh, kind of rewind the clock a little bit and find out exactly where writing became a part of your life because you know you've got a you know it's clear on your website and your twitter you've got a bit of history and, and a few different careers so at what point did writing become something that you were interested in it, it's always been something i've been interested in to be honest but it's not something i thought i would ever be able to do um because mm -hmm. i'm a working class lad from newcastle or, or from cumbria depending on who i'm, who I'm think, speaking to uh it wasn't until but and i've always been a big reader as i, as I, I suppose we all have and I, I used to write until I joined the army, actually. When I joined the army, I, I didn't write at all. But I, I read an awful lot. When I um, 
left the army and, and did my degree in social work and then joined probation ultimately I started I, I started to play about with it again just just for my own amusement really um, but I, I, I was I was very ill in 2003-2004 and I, I wanted to write about my experiences like just an autobiography just to get it out of my system type thing mm. uh, and this was a few years later this is about 10 years later and um, ultimately I I, I it wasn't working. I thought I'm just going to write a fiction book, but I'm going to give my protagonist exactly the same illness I had, wow. and I did. And I, um, I I just jotted down the first few ideas I had, and then I, that book, Born in the Burial Gown, was shortlisted for the debut dagger, the CWA debut mm-hmm. dagger in 2013, and it, and went down to London for the. I didn't win, but it was a, a huge thrill. I met Lee Child, and I mean, and when you're when you new to this world that's like absolutely amazing yeah. um so it was then i thought i can I, i'm gonna give this a proper go so i started writing mm. properly um and in 2015 i was offered the chance of redundancy and i thought i'm gonna i'm gonna take this because i had my first book was out there it was with a very small publisher but i was a published author so i thought mm. I'll, I'll i'll give it a go i said i will give it three years and if i haven't made it enough to live on in three years i'll get a job as a social mm. worker so, and my wife said you can give it a year, not three years. So we compromised. <laughs> so we, we, we compromised that a year, um, mm. and yeah, and then I signed with my agent shortly after. And then um, mm. he, he asked me to write a new series, which, which um, the first book, and that was the Puppet Show. And then that that was picked up by Little Brown in 2017. So wow, mm. all been fairly positive since then. Mm. Yeah. So um, what was that year like? Like you know obviously you have to negotiate a year to start with because i'm guessing like finances possibly come into play or maybe she didn't want you to sort of get complacent and it take forever so what 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 is it like when you first started and you sat down and you thought yeah i'm going to i'm going to be a writer and i'm going to do it properly like you don't need to go to work today in that capacity yeah that was, that was, i mean she's very supportive i mean I, and she she knows that I, I, I mean i don't look that's sensible, but I, I, I am sensible about some things. So the mortgage was paid off um, mm. very shortly after anyway, because I've been on a, a decent salary. I was an assistant chief officer in probation mm. up here, so I was on a good salary, particularly for, for this part of the of the country. Um, so mm. I've been saving. I, I, had, I had enough savings. And that's what I say. I'll, I, I reckon I had enough savings to, for, to last me about 18 months without yeah. sort of, mm. I, I said what was important, that I didn't want her her sort of, um, to have to make sacrifices, um, it, I was fine with making sacrifices of my own, but I didn't think it was fair to ask Joanne to. Um, mm-hmm. Although she ended up just joining in, and it was it was good fun. But when when I signed with um, David, my agent, mm-hmm. and it, I don't think it's until you actually signed with it with an agent, you don't, you don't understand the sort of impact that that can have on you on your mm-hmm. career because they open doors that you're not even allowed to knock on when you're an agent. Um, so it was then, and I thought, well, yeah, if if David can get me a deal with the big publisher, like he says, like he says he wants mm. me, then we'll probably be okay. Mm. And when I signed with Little Brown in 2017, March 2017, I think, I thought, well, yeah, this is probably going to work out all right. Because even if it doesn't take off, I'll still be making mm. enough just to sort of tide me over. But it's it's working out quite well at the moment. Yeah, wow. uh, there's a lot of obviously life experience you got there, you know, being in the forces and then in probation as well. And obviously as a crime writer, you know, you could probably draw a lot from those experiences. Did you rely on that for those experiences or was kind of your creative side there anyway enough to kind of provide yeah. that? I I, I, th- I think my army days have, have taught me how to um, look at books more critically, as weirdly yeah. as that sounds. And, and the reason for that is when you go, out on exercise or you're in a um you're on operations or something you're basically um carrying you're carrying your house on you so that you, you don't have space for look for luxuries so mm. everyone t- would take a book and then you would swap it around and invariably when you'd swap books you end up discussing them and what do you like mm. about that what didn't you like about that book so i sort of learned how to critique books and i got to understand what i liked and what i didn't like um, and I also picked up some of the dark humour, and that comes through in some of the books. Um, mm. Probation, I, I use it when there's a prison visit or something or something technical like that. But mm. the main thing I, I got from probation, well, two things actually. The first thing was I understood how the county worked. As I went up mm. through the ranks, I was having meetings with 
um, middle managers and other organizations and eventually i was having meeting with the top bosses like the chief constable and and, and things like that and i was sitting on the anti-terrorism board the safeguard and children board safeguard and adults board the alcohol abuse board all that um all that stuff but mm -hmm. also um when we write, write court reports which i did for a number of years and then i would be um, inspecting other people's court reports it was all about uh, brevity and mm. um using accessible language um, because uh, the offender had to read it magistrates who are untrained i mean so i mean some of them aren't that bright so you need to use accessible language for magistrates as well um mm. so so that, that I, I don't I, I don't think it dawned on me until maybe a year two years ago when someone mm. says you have a an interesting style of writing um, mm. and i thought yeah it's because it's because I've, I've trained myself over the years to write short snappy quite easy easy, easy to understand sentences and, and that's just the way i've sort of carried on and interestingly mm. when i try to change that now if i try to get too fancy my editor just takes it out i said yeah very nice <laughs> well, i remember in black summer i had this description of um a uh, a bush in winter which with like the dead tight um, buds wait, waiting for spring to come out and it was about mm. half a page you went yeah that's absolutely lovely and then just deleted it <laughs> <laughs> fine okay yeah, i won't do that again uh, that's amazing yeah, i love it there's obviously uh you know a period of your writing before your careers um afterwards and before lockdown and after lockdown so how have you felt uh, you know um dead ground has come out this month really at the back of lockdown how have you found that process? Has it changed much for you as an author at all uh, and publishing wise as well? Um, I, I found this one a bit easier. I mean, the, the creator was out last about the same time last year. Um, mm. and I think that was during lockdown. I, I, mm. They're all running into each other now, aren't they? This time <laughs> we sort of knew that the shops would be open, which was, which was okay. And mm. um, last year, in fact, last year the shops were shut and the pubs were shut and everything. I remember because um, I, I did an online launch on on Facebook and there was two thousand people watching it. This this time there was about two hundred people watching it. Wow. Um, so obviously because the pubs were open and it was a Friday night and there was actually things to do. Whereas la last yeah. time it was the first night and there wasn't anything to do. So let's just mm. go and watch that idiot. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I think there's been some positives. In launching the book because you, you get to do a lot more of these the events like mm. this which is obviously accessible for for people who a don't have the funds to come and see because i have my launches in carlisle and I, I i would have one in carlisle a big one and then i'd have a more uh, a, a smaller but more ex i'm not gonna say exclusive but arranged by my publisher at um goldsborough in covent garden um mm. and they were the two main main venues and i'll do a few book signings like in in person signings mm. But unless you've got the funds or you happen to live in Carlisle, it, it's a bit of an ask to come up to, um, to, hear, to hear someone like me talk um, or any author, quite frankly. Um, so having them having the opportunity for anyone to dip in and out of these online things is, is really good. And next year, if we are back to as normal as we're going to get, I'll, I'll continue to do the online things because I, th I think mm. they're really, really good. Yeah, it's definitely yeah. opened up a, a a lot of people's eyes in in many industries of what could happen as a result of this mm. and, and especially as you said accessibility is huge um mm. so so have you got any kind of fun um live signing or, or sort of <laughs> uh stories in that respect um any, any any crazy fans yeah i mean every time a new book comes out um the i have to go to um bookends which is my local from Carlisle, and I signed about eight books to my number one fan, and they're all, mm -hmm. all going to different addresses. Um, so <laughs> at some point, I might get them in the room and just write, write mm. one of you is allowed to leave. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, you do, you get to, you get, I mean, one per, one, one person um, sent me, uh, or I had the, this sort of bit of paper, can you write this in the book, please? And it mm. was about 400 words, and I only had like a Sharpie mm. with it. Basically, mm. thick felt it pen. So I was like, I can't, <laughs> can't do that. Uh, when, when I um, I was book of the month at Goldsboro actually for the puppet show, so I had to go down to London and sign seven hundred and fifty copies, which oh, wow. uh, which and they knew they said it'll take about two hours and almost it did. Thing. But um, somebody got a WM Craven. I was a punch drunk. I couldn't remember my own name. <laughs> um, so yeah, oh, wow. I mean. I, I, I treat them quite quite seriously, the, the yeah. signings, because obviously people are shelling out um, their own money, so it's not for me to, to sort mm -hmm. of dick around. 
as, as much. I, 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 but I do like chatting to, to people. And I, I did one in Carlisle just last week, last Saturday, I think it was. And um, they just put me on the street because they didn't want me in, inside. Um, it was baking hot. And, but people had come, people had travelled um, a couple of hours in the car to come and see me, which, which was... It, 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 it's quite flattering as well, but, um, but you, you, you can't then just sign the book and say, right, away with you, because I'm going to King's Head at four o'clock exactly. <laughs> um, you've got to you've got to engage, and I enjoy it anyway, so it, yeah. it, it, it's not a hardship, but I'm, I'm always aware that it's it's a privilege doing this, and if you abuse it, then you won't be, people will soon vote with the people, won't they? So we've, so we've chatted, sorry, uh, enough about kind of uh, your, your sort of past and, and kind of things that you've been doing. Let's talk about Dead Ground very briefly for the ones that are watching that may not have uh, read about this or, or know about it. Can you tell us a bit about that? And then we can look into that story very slowly. Yeah. All right. So Dead Ground, it's the fourth. This is a nice, shiny Watchstones edition with the extra short story in the back and the sprayed edges. Um, it picks up fairly soon after the events of the creator, which I won't go into here, but they were fairly traumatic. And... Um, so Poe and Tilia are the main characters in this. Steph Flynn's sort of taking the back seat in this one. She, she's the boss. So the, the, the book actually starts with a um, a bank robbery where everyone, the robbers are all wearing James Bond masks and they are there for one specific safety deposit box. They open it and it's empty and the guy in charge knew it was going to be empty and um, Timothy Dalton, the guy in the Timothy Dalton mask, not the real Timothy Dalton. <laughs> um, says, oh, we'll look somewhere else. And then mm. the, it's um, Sean Connery says, we're not here to make a withdrawal. We're here to make a deposit. And then he shoots him in the back of the head. So that's how it starts. Um, and then it, it quickly goes to um, a civil court thing where Poe's fighting to keep his house. Um, he's got till he's enlisted Tilly to do his legal work. They're about to win. And then MI5 agents come in and whisk them away for a, a briefing because someone... Um, a, a VIP helicopter pilot hmm. um, who who was um, involved in a nearby trade trade summit has been murdered, and they need Poe's um, no, no nonsense approach to seeing if it's safe for the summit to go ahead. So that's basically the the early plot of the book, and it goes and then Poe has to, po goes head to head with the security service, which is which is which is quite fun, and he yeah. he doesn't like being told what to do at the best of times, but he certainly doesn't like being lied to and and try to, mm. manipulated and, and that thing. So it's a bit mm. of fun. We mentioned very much at the, at the start of the show about the ratings that this book has got already, being the fact that it came out at the start of the month. Um, how how do you feel like writing a series? Do you ever feel a pressure to obviously you've done it well, you know, very well twice. You got two great series on the go. Do you ever feel a pressure that each time you write this, that you needs to hold a standard? And do you ever fear that you know the audience might just drift away? Is there ever that kind of challenge there? Uh, yeah, and I think if you don't have that fear, then then you become complacent and you, you you're going to mess it up. Um, the I I, I I think there's, there's a difference between trying to make each book better than the last, which is what I try to do, and obviously other people will will judge that. But there's a difference between doing that and then making each make ramping up the action yeah. in each mm. book, because otherwise you're just going to get an absurd thing where Poe's stopping a nuclear war or something <laughs> like that. Um, now the events of were quite high octane. The events in the creator, um, it, it was mm. quite violent and quite upsetting ending. So I was very mm. conscious. I didn't want to do that i want to sort of just calm it down a little bit um mm. make it a little bit funny albeit serious and there was a very serious um sort of genesis for what for everything that happened um something quite um sort of close and this is a story i've been wanting to write for a while and my editor kept on saying no to it um for mm. very good reasons actually until i actually got it right got the proposal mm. right um, and also, I, I know what was coming next because I was I'm always planning the book ahead. Mm. Way, um, so it was a fun book to write because uh, it was ba it's basically Poe and Tilly. I mean, they're, they're, and there's mm. a, a few people coming in and out now and then, but um, there's very Poe has very little supervision in this one. Normally, he has Steph Flynn reining them back in and telling me he can't do things. In this one, he's he's, he's just doing what he wants. Um, mm. And he gets himself into trouble like he does, and until he bails him out like she does, and mm. Um, mm. it's good. But yeah, it's been well received. I was hoping it would because it's my favourite in, mm. in the series. I think ultimately, I think Black Summer will endure as the one with the highest 
mm. the highest rating because that seems to be st staying at 4.7. All the other books seem to settle at 4.6 when you get the the people saying my book didn't arrive one star that type of thing. When you yeah, when, when you take when you, when you when you sort of take that average, um, so I think Black mm. Summer will ultimately sort of stick with it um, yeah. is the highest rated book. So when you sat when you sit down, uh, uh, do you plan the whole thing out before? Like you said briefly there, that you're always thinking ahead. Is mm. that just a little bit of an idea, and then you sit down, or are you quite meticulous? With no, I, 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 I have a sort of a way of working, which I, I don't know if anyone else has actually, because I don't actually write a plan down or anything. But because I've, I've been thinking about the next story, so I am thinking mm. about the next story now, and I have a lever arch file full of ideas and mm. lines of dialogue and bits of research and um, specific plot points. And when it comes down to write it, the first thing I do is I've got like 12 months worth of notes and I sort through them into a, a kind of chronological order. And then I just work through that. So I have a sort of blueprint, but it's a lever arch file full of, mm. full of stuff. Um, and that seems to work for me. And anything I don't use um, quite often gets carried over to the next book. So there, there are scenes in Dead Grounds. Mm. Which were originally in Black Summer, for example. The the um that conversation mm. called we have about Quidditch, um, Muggle Quidditch. Um that was that's been in three books now. It was only this mm. one that actually managed to stay in. Um, <laughs> I, I have a way of but, working. I, 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 I plan it mm. out. I, I'm not meticulous and it always changes. Mm. <coughs> So with the dark humor side of things, when you're writing, like I know myself, like I could write something and find it hilarious and then I'll show it to my girlfriend and she'll be like, oh. <laughs> like, so <laughs> how do you judge that? Like, who, what's the process there? Like, I, 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 I some people, you, I, I, you get asked this a lot and I'm sure you, you guys do mm. as well. Um, can you train yourself to be an author, I, I suppose? And, and the easy answer is yes, you can, because, um, it's a skill like anything else, and you and you can get better at it. Um, and with the right mentors and the right books and that type of thing, you you, you can. But what you can't teach is you can't teach someone to have a um, sense of humour or mm. an imagination. They're the two things that you have to actually have. Mm. Um, and if you don't have them, then you're going to have to write literary novels. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> so they're always having a go at us, aren't they? Mm. The um, <coughs> <laughs> you know, just, if I, if I, don't joke, Chris. Don't joke. If I <laughs> then that's good enough for me. Then hopefully yeah. other people mm. will find it funny. Uh, mm. I'll, I'll I'll say things to to Joanne, and sometimes she she'll think, well, that's not funny. And sometimes mm. she'll be right. She'll say, well, Paul wouldn't say that to Tilly. He doesn't mm. swear when, when in her presence mm. now because he has mm. he has sort of very, he, he tends to limit his um, swearing. So th there's there's that to a certain thing, but the, the funny and. I will write a whole scene just to get one funny line in. Sometimes, mm. <laughs> um, in this short story, I've just I've, I've just I had a line I, wa I wanted um, to. It was it just went in today actually. Uh, Till Tilly's talking to a suspect and just saying it's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. And she said last year I had to listen to Poe explain how Bitcoin worked. Um, <laughs> so I put I was absolutely delighted with that. I thought that's hilarious. <laughs> Nobody else finds it funny. I find it funny. Mm. It's, it's going in this short story. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think unless you've got a sense of humour, you you can't write mm. humour. I mean, I, I I honestly think that. Um, yeah. Do, do you, obviously, we're talking there about having an imagination, and that you can't teach an imagination or learn to sort of get one. How do you think your imagination was formed if we take you back a little bit to sort of like childhood? And obviously you said reading has been a big factor in your mm. life, but is there, is there sort of specific things that you can pinpoint and go, yeah, I was that sort of piqued my interest in books or I was really interested in watching that series or that really had a profound effect on me? I, I think it's a couple of things. I mean, I mean, I'm just being nosy is is always an asset for an author, isn't it? I, I was mm. in, going down the the Wikipedia um, rabbit hole and just following link after link, so you, you just go, oh, mm. and then suddenly you're, you're over there, and you think, oh, actually, I can use that. But when I was a kid, yeah, I was just I was just nosy. I was always into stuff, and I was all like, I was always flitting between hobbies, and I, I had like a fish tank in my bedroom, which was like mouldy with algae after like a month because I got bored of that. I wanted, I wanted to have one that was like steam engines that you put water in, it actually worked, and um, things like that. And I was like model airplanes, and it was football, and it was cricket, and then and things. So I was all over the place, and I couldn't settle. And my wife will say I'm exactly the same now that I have all these little mm. 
hobbies and I'm obsessed by them or and thing, and things like that. But um, <laughs> so yeah, I, I think that, I think that's part of it. But mm. I, I also when I'm writing, um, and it, it's a technique I learned in probation actually, a management technique, which um, sounds dull, but it was to say I, I've adapted it. But when we're plotting strategy and things, we would mm. always say why why we're we doing this. And then say, oh, we're doing this because of that. And you say, but why are we doing that? And then, all oh, right. Um, and eventually you get down and you decide if actually if we needed to do it at all. But I, I take that another way and I say, um, what if? So mm. I'll start with the basic premise and I'll say, what if? What? If, but what if that happened? And then if that happens, mm. what if that happened because that had happened and things like that. So you'll get this. So that's sort of how I sort of plot, I think, mm. without actually writing down. I certainly don't plot on paper. I think mm. I think if you try to work a plot, if you try to force it out, it, it becomes a bit. I don't know. I mean, most of my good ideas happen organically when I'm yeah. walking the dog or that, in the shower. People who say plotting mm. kind of restricts the imagination or, or the growth of a story as well. So I think you're using, you're using a different part of your brain, aren't you? So yeah. I, I think um, it's, you're using the logical part of your brain, which isn't where all the um, the creative side comes from. Mm. So quite often, it's just the spark of. Yeah. Something okay. it could be absolutely anything. I, I mean, the the story I'm uh, the sorry the Poe novel I'm writing now, which I finished the first draft. The genesis of that came a few years ago when my wife and I were walking to the pub on Christmas Eve mm. for our sort of afternoon drink, and there was um, our neighbour. What well, actually someone on the street was building a what we thought was going to be a conservatory. Actually, it turned out to just to be an extension. But at the time, mm. it looked like um, a stable. On Christmas mm. Eve, um, just it just had the wall up and it had the struts, but didn't have any windows in or anything like that. Mm. I said, uh, wouldn't it be funny if in the morning someone had like snuck in and put three wise men <laughs> and, 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 and a major? And then I said, wouldn't it be good if there was a dead baby in it? And <laughs> <laughs> what's wrong with you? And but uh, but and that sort of that stayed with me. I didn't write it down or anything, but I remembered it, and I thought, and that's just that kernel of the idea. That mm. is. Um, going to be, um, well, that's what influenced the Mercy Chair. It's got nothing to do with a dead baby or a stable or anything. Mm. That's, that's, so that's where that idea came from. And it just went, just shot and it just went left field and it came, and it came back and it went off it. So wow. it, it, it's a very difficult thing to explain, but uh, it works. But yeah. the thing is, everyone's different as well. Everyone has their own way of writing. Don't they? Yeah. So, mm. so what yeah. we're going to do now <laughs> is we're going to play a very quick uh, video and then we're going to go on to some of our staple questions and then we're going to get questions from you guys that are watching uh, for Mike or for me and Chris or for all of us together. Uh, so if you have questions, start sending them in and we'll just play a little video and we'll get on to our uh, staple questions. <laughs> Hi guys, I'm here to talk about the amazing ProWriting Aid and how I wish I had this software in my first two novels. I'm writing my third at the moment and I really want to get it sent off to a real publisher and this is going to make all the difference. Yeah, if you want to get yourself agent ready, then this is definitely the tool for you. And it's got a really cool tool where you can compare your writing to somebody else's. So you can compare your work to Stephen King or Paul Hawkins. Yeah, really test yourself, go to town. It is fantastic. And if you click on the link in the description of the podcast or the YouTube video, you will find a 20% discount affiliate link, which will help us out and help yourself out. So please check out Pro Writing Aid today. Awesome. So, uh, <laughs> Freaks me out every time. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you get out, we'll start off with the staple questions and guys start sending your questions in. Yeah. So we have quite a few staple questions. Um, and they do get a little bit morbid, but this one's quite a nice one. Um, so if you could take any character from fiction and make that character your own and do whatever you wanted with it, um, which character would you choose and why? Uh, Sam Vimes from Terry Pratchett's Discworld, I, I think, mm. um, along with Harry Bosch. I think he's the, <laughs> the uh, I think he's my favourite literary character of all yeah. time. And I would have him working with Poe, I think. They would butt heads. They would probably annoy annoy the hell out of each other. But ultimately, I think yeah. they um, they, would, they would solve some cases together. Fantastic. That's a brilliant answer. I love that. <clears throat> That's possibly the quickest answer we've had as well. <laughs> yeah. That's just a yeah. great one. Uh, okay, so uh, following on from that, if you could take the ending of anything, TV, fiction, uh, film, whatever kind of story, and change it, it doesn't necessarily have to be a bad changing or a good whatever it may be, what would you change the ending to and why? Um, 
Do you know, do you know I, I, I watch Heat, uh, the De Niro, Pacino film, every time it's on TV, actually. You've even I've got, like, the director's cut and what, six mm. people there. I just can't, I, I can't not watch it. There's two <laughs> parts in that film I will change. The first part is when they're about to kill Wayne Grove and stuff him in the back of the thing, and the police car comes, and then by the time they come back, he, he's disappeared. That annoys me every time. And every time I watch it, I go, just... <laughs> But um, <laughs> you know, at the end, I've all, I've always thought it would have been nice if um, De Niro escaped with um, the, the girl as well. But I mean, obviously he couldn't because they'd murdered people. But I, I was sort of rooting from all the way through the film because he was essentially a, quite a good, quite a good guy. He was ruthless, but he, he wasn't a bad guy. Mm. Love that. <clears throat> so our next question that we have is, again, this goes into the sort of morbid realm. If you had to resurrect an author on the condition that part of that resurrection meant you could write a novel with them, but then you had to kill them, which author would you resurrect and how would you kill them? <laughs> nice. Um, Arthur Conan Doyle, I suppose. I was going to say Terry Pratchett, but I really don't want to kill him. Um, <laughs> Arthur Conan Doyle. Um, mm. I love the Sherlock Holmes, Sherlock Holmes books. and it'll be, I think mm. it would be quite fascinating just to, 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 to write with him. Um, and I'd, I'd kill him with one of his um, more wacky the ways he, he killed his um, victims. Probably the um, the uh, whist whistling for the snake down the bedpole and tempting it back <laughs> in milk. Because at that time, the thinking was that snakes lived in barns, so therefore they must drink milk, um, which is obviously absolute bollocks. Um, <laughs> so yeah, if a poisonous snake, I would, I would, I would kill him. <laughs> kill him I love it. That's a great answer. Yeah, it is very good. Um, I, uh, Chris, I'll ask this one then because you normally get mm. around to this one. So again, uh, Chris likes to ask morbid questions. So this one is, uh, you're lying on your deathbed and you're looking back at your life and your writing career. Uh, what would you find a success for you? What would, you know, be a pinnacle of success for, for your writing career? Um, probably, I'd say the gold dagger, uh, is a pretty thing being on a Sunday times bestseller now dead ground hit the Sunday times um, bestseller chart with, and that's a, that was the first time that my, one of my books had so that was that was a thing mm. um, but I, I think ultimately being just being published it was mm. a sort of an unachievable dream when I when I was little and it, it's happened now all the, all the other stuff is the icing on the cake but unless you've got a, mm. an actual cake to put the icing on you've just got a, <laughs> a, a sickly mm. Thing to me, and um, yeah, so being a published author, I, I think ultimately you would be because there's so many talented people, yeah. talented writers who, who who never get never get to be published, and that's because one of the things that nobody will tell you in this business, there's an awful lot of luck involved. Sometimes mm. you got to be in the right place. So I mean, I was in the right place at the right time. I happened to meet my agent. Mm. I happened to have a copy of one of the fluke books, and I was able. To, I, I said, yeah, have that. Um, and I, he took it, and I said, "That's six quid, please." And I didn't really. Um, <laughs> and he read it. He read it that night, and I saw him the next day. And he said, "Next time you've got something to um, submit, please do send it to me." And that, that's just a blind bit of luck. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of people who won't to, won't tell you that. And there's also some incredibly talented writers who are published but aren't getting the recognition they absolutely mm -hmm. deserve. And there's there's no rhyme or reason why one one author is more successful than. It's not always about the best author. It's not always about the cream rising to the top. Sometimes the cream will get stuck yeah. in mm. the mediocrity sometimes, and it's really sad. Mm. But that's why I don't mind helping authors out when I can, and because I've had mm. I've had leg up by authors. Um, mm. in a, Fantastic. A, the community is quite a quite a nice community to part. Yeah, I mean that does tie into one of the questions that we do kind of have. It's if you could recommend an author that people may not know about. Is there a couple that you would recommend, or who would you recommend, and what book would you recommend them to read? Um, that's a tough one. I don't, I don't want to insult someone by saying <laughs> I've heard of this guy. Um, Basim Khan, I think, is a is a hugely underrated writer. I mean, he's he's with a big publishing house, but I really do enjoy his books. the The first one in his new series, um, Midnight at Malabar House, it, it is exceptional. It's set in um, a newly independent India, um, mm. following the first female police detective, really, really good. Um, and also, he named one of his victims um, James Herriot because he, he didn't actually realise James Herriot was a very famous TV <laughs> and, um, literary vet. Um, mm. And also, none of his copy editors had, had pointed that out or anything like that, which I found quite. <laughs> um, mm. Anyone else? Um, 
I mean, there's just so many good writers out there, isn't there? There is. Um, um, We'll, we'll, it's fine, we'll move on. Uh, what we'll do is the new family member because um, you mentioned how the community is very good and strong within the world of writing and it's no different on Twitter and our group of, of, of our community as well. So we have a new family member. We'll play this fantastic little intro that I think I forgot last week, Chris. Oh, yes. You did. I know. I was very I know. disappointed. <laughs> I'll have my, my little hand slap for that. Uh, and then what we'll do is we'll send this person a GIF as a collective and uh, welcome them to the family. So here it comes. So uh, today's new family member, this person has recently followed the show on Twitter and they have a very low following. They need a bit of a boost and a welcome. So that person is SL McManus and their Twitter handle is at SLM, uh, little c, big M, uh, McManus author. And she says, lover, uh, lover of the North, um, dog mum. Okay. Uh, she's got an agent and Perry uh, and she has 50 followers. So Chris... Uh, Mark, um, Mike, what are we sending them in terms of a GIF? What theme are we going for? Oh, from the north. Something from Game of Thrones from the north. Uh, as soon as I read that, it was that, that popped in my head. Yeah, definitely. So, Chris, can you find that person? Uh, and I can. We... Yes. Well this done. is pretty embarrassing. Oh, I've just found her, but it's pretty embarrassing because she already follows me and she's from Manchester, so I've been quite rude there. <laughs> well, <laughs> do you know her? No, I don't. <laughs> yeah, I'm following her back now, so I need to yeah, yeah. Uh, rectify that. So only 50 followers. I think she's been on for a couple of years on Twitter as well. So either not posting much or maybe, uh, I don't know. Um, I don't know. But follow her and send her a, a, a From the North gif and say welcome to the family there. So um, <laughs> while Chris is doing that, guys, start sending your questions in for the question community time and... You know, if you've got any questions about the genre, about the books, about a Gold Dagger Award or anything like that, send them in and we will get them answered. Um, let's find a question from here. From the North. From the North. <laughs> question from Ross, Ross Young. Thank you, Ross. He says, I occasionally, yes, occasionally, write something and decide it's too dark. Really? Um, <laughs> do you find yourself censoring yourself in your writing? I don't. Um my editor sometimes does they'll say well, that's a bit much that's a bit much um particularly in the creator there was um there was two parts of the creator that you said now you you've just had that bit you really need to lighten the mood a bit here mm -hmm. um i i don't think there's anything that you should censor yourself um if you feel it's wrong then it probably is wrong but i don't think you should censor it because you think somebody else might think it's yeah yeah Wrong. I mean, there's certain things I wouldn't write about, but not because I was afraid of the of, of, of writing something too dark. Just something that it doesn't necessarily interest me, or it's exploitative. Because I, I would never write about a spree killer in Cumbria, for example, because we, we had a, uh, uh, we had Derek Bird up here um, a few years ago, and he, he he murdered twelve of my fellow Cumbrians. So I would never write about a spree killer just because that wouldn't feel right. Mm. What's the relationship like you mentioned working with an editor when they say oh that you can and can't have these things uh, for someone who hasn't gone through that process how do you receive that sort of advice and do you ever kind of get frustrated by that because you think it's the right thing well ultimately it's your but if you insist on it then most of the time they'll they'll, they'll if if you help them understand why you want it in for example yeah. there was a bit in blacksmith when I was um, I was saying one thing he said it's nice but it doesn't really move the story forward and i said yeah i need it in because it's gonna be very relevant in the next book mm -hmm. um so that that was an example but it's a collaboration ultimately and ultimately they want to make the book better so if i will always listen um mm -hmm. because i mean the editors i have and i have three overall they they all have been in the business a lot longer than me and they, they all want to sell books they all want to make the books the best they they can sometimes i'll just put my foot down and say no it's staying in um mm. the the most obvious example was when i had an argument not an argument but a sort of um a back and forth with my copy editor when he was saying the correct spelling of dry stone wall is dry uh, dry stone as one word then 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 wall and i said actually it's three words up here in Cumbria we say dry stone wall and mm. um he said no this it's on the oxford manual of style which is what they all all use 
And I, I, I copied an email or forwarded an email from the actual Dry Stone Wall Association saying, no, it's definitely. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, so, yeah, it, I mean, you, you take it on the chin. And, some, and some, mm. sometimes when they, they, they say, um, this isn't working or you need to cut this chapter back or you've waffled on here, mm. then you go, right, well, fair enough. That's just, that's just what it is. Brilliant. Mm. A uh, question from Linda. Thank you for your question, Linda. She says, what, in your opinion, are the traits of the ultimate antagonist? Mm, that's a good question. Mm. <laughs> but for me, and I think this goes back to um, one inspiration, I want to know what their motivations are. Um, they've got to have believable reasons for doing what they're doing because ev everyone um, who is watching and ev ev all of us here will go through a um, risk um a cost benefit analysis before we do absolutely anything mm. um, and that would be going out without an umbrella that type of thing i mean not that i ever go out with an umbrella but that, that's <laughs> the type of thing um mm. so last, last saturday i was doing the sign joanne says um you need a jumper because it's actually quite cold this morning i would say no but in my head i quickly said the cost benefit right the benefit would mm. be me not being cold but the cost would be me loving a jump around all day and i don't particularly want to um and that's the same when it comes to people who are committing some awful things, unless there's a genuine mental illness involved. Mm. Most of the time, they ha they have decided it's what they want to do, and they've got their own yeah. they've got their own reasons. And I think those reasons have to be believable. Otherwise, they are going to come up as as um, they're not, they're not going to come up as fully fleshed three dimensional characters. Yeah, I think when you mentioned uh, you know the character from Heat, that sometimes if the antagonist is almost relatable and you know, favorable, that makes mm. a massive difference as well. And not being too far gone to hate that person so much, you kind of want them to succeed as well. I, I do. I th and I think some of my, some of my um, antagonists are actually quite sympathetic. Mm. Some mm. of them are absolutely awful. Like Jared Keaton, the, the um, celebrity chef, he was absolutely horrific. Um, but he was quite a fun character to, to, to write. Um, and even though technically I, I, I've written two serial killer novels, they're not really. They, they I mean, they, there's genuine motivations, and and sort of you come to understand the, the um, why why things were happening. The fifth book actually out next year is an out and out serial killer novel, mm. and the guy's just a dick. Um, <laughs> it, 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 he's just driven by his own ego. But in his mind, that is a genuine motivation. But but that's the first sort of out and out serial killer I've done where the well, there's no redeeming uh, qualities to the antagonist whatsoever. Is that quite a fun character to write, or is that something that you've that you you constantly tackle in terms of should I make this character a bit more sympathetic, or is it just no? I'm going to go hell to leather with this one. I'm just going to completely go at it, and they're going to be the most evil bastard I can create. I I, I don't. Uh, I, I think it just it depends on what the plot needs, Chris. So mm. in um, in the botanist, which is the next one, I wanted to write a locked room mystery. Mm. Ultimately, it's a locked room mystery, albeit it takes over. It's a lock that, that takes across the whole of the UK, um, mm. and so the actual motivations behind the person doing it weren't as important as how he's doing it. Mm. In uh, the Mercy Chair, which is out possibly 2023, we might be pushed back to 24 now because I've got a standalone coming out at some point. Um, I wanted to do a book where when you got to the end, you had to sort of reevaluate everything that you'd written because what mm. you thought was happening isn't actually happening. A bit like Shutter yeah. Island or along, along those mm. lines. Um, and again, okay. for that for that book, I, I, I absolutely needed to go much more deeper into the uh, mm. into all the key all the key characters. That, so you flesh them out, and the more you flesh them out, I think it's easier to give them genuine human motivations for doing what they're doing and it's much more interesting mm. to write a book l like that to be honest i mean the cardboard mm. villains are, are, are useful sometimes mm. um, but ultimately if you're going to get sort of quite an emotional story out of something everyone needs to be doing there everyone needs to be pulling mm. the bait, I suppose, to the point of the yeah definitely so is is that where some of the like creative motivation is coming from now from uh, you know where you're concerned obviously you've written a book you've written plenty of books now you've had success are you now going i'm ticking off my sort of book bucket list in terms of i want to do a book like this then i want to do a book like this and I, I quite like to do that as well is that something that you're 
Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, there's two things. I, I don't want to write the same book twice. I mean, I, I think that's important. Mm. But my, the, I mean, the pub, you'll hear in the publishing industry this the same but different. Mm. So they want books that are going to appeal to fans of the series, but mm. they don't want just the same book with different names in it, obviously. So I, I do sort of just like to say, so a lot of room mystery in um, the book I've got planned for seven, which is written in the very early plan. I want to do a COVID novel that isn't mm. a COVID novel. Um, so I want to evoke the sort of feelings everyone had yeah. in, mm. in the first lockdown when you were sort of a bit scared to go out your house, um, mm. uh, and you weren't you weren't you weren't really you didn't feel safe, um, completely safe at all times. So I want to do a novel, uh, and it's not about a virus at all. It's about something completely different. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I just saw, that in, and ultimately, it's about challenging yourself to a certain degree. And if you're not challenging yourself, then you're going to start getting bored. And if you get bored, then your books are going to become a bit a bit mm. stale. Yeah, fantastic. So I, I just want to ask you a slight question linked to yesterday's guest. So we had Phil Earl on yesterday, and he was talking about uh, reluctant readers and people that um, he he talked about his aim in writing was making sure the readers sort of never bored. And obviously, he writes for young, like middle grade books and young adult books as well. Um, now I think when when. <laughs> Because I, I teach as well, and I've got a lot of kids that I think, I would love to show you my Craven book and just get you into this, but I can't at this moment in time because it would be inappropriate. Um, but I suppose the question is, if what advice would you give to those reluctant readers that maybe are sat there going, oh, I don't read, like I'm not a big reader. What 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 sort of things would you say to them? I, I, I mean, there's a, there's a scheme now which not everyone's heard of called uh, Quick Reads. Now, mm. that is designed at um, readers who, who are literate but mm. um, don't feel confident with, with, with books, I mean, which sounds exactly what, you, what you're thinking mm. of. And every year, six authors um, publish a novella, so it's a very thin book, mm. um, no more than 20,000 words, I, I believe, and it's priced at 99p. For the paperback mm. or for the Kindle, um, it's been running a few years now. So there's a lot of books to choose from, and the author um, uses um, much more accessible language than than they mm. would in perhaps their uh, in their series books. Um, so I, I don't know who's actually doing it this year, um, but there's always some big names. Uh, I know my friend A. A. Dan did it a couple of years ago, and um, mm. so it's, it's a self-contained story. Very it's, it's not a complex plot. Um, the language is, is very, um, very user friendly. So that's where I would start. It, uh, just as a simple way of getting someone into into reading, and mm. it's not it's not a crime writer's thing. It's across it's across the board. So I think Adam Kay, the the author of This Is Gonna Hurt, there's a much more bridged yeah. version of his book. Just a, a short thing with some of the the the, the funnier elements in. So that's mm. as good a place as any to start. Yeah. I think. Um, Ultimately, it's about, I don't know, I've always found with, with writing, it's listening to people who are readers and then just take, just saying, what do you recommend? This is what I'm interested in. Mm. I'm interested yeah. in football. There's any books about football, that type of thing, that are interesting, that, that, that mm. type of thing. And readers are such a, a nice community that you'll, mm. you'll end up with about 4,000 suggestions. <laughs> and at that point, you've probably got too much choice. You need to sort of narrow yeah. it down a bit. But ultimately... I, I would either start with a quick reads thing or a similar program mm. to that, or um, just ask, just ask someone who who actually is a reader and just say, look, mm. what would you recommend? I don't, I don't yeah, mean because I mean, a lot of my, mm. a lot of my readers are people who read one book a year and they read it on holiday, um, mm. and will say, will tell me that say, um, uh, I don't, I don't know when I'm going to read your book this year because the holidays are been, are been <laughs> crap. Well, I'll have to have like. Four weeks off next year. That, that, yeah. that, that's absolutely fine, and it, it's nice when that happens. Mm. So we've we've got three more questions left, and we've probably got time for one of them, uh, and they've just popped up in a row. So Mike, I'll give you the choice: question one, two, or three. <laughs> uh, three. Question three. Um, hello to you, Shanby. I hope I'm saying that right. She says she. I have assuming. Uh, how do you go about uh, silent characters? Which I like this question. Uh, characters who are important later in a series, but in the background in the beginning. Thank you yeah, for that question. That's a good question. I yeah, I mean, it is a very good question actually, and it's I haven't, something I haven't been asked it before. I because I planned so far ahead. 
I, I, I know who the who the characters are going to be, which characters are going to be recurring, for, for example. Mm. Um, and some characters, when you write them for the first time, you think, well, that, you've got to meet him again. I mean, there's a, there's a tramp or a homeless guy in um, Dead Ground called Bugger Rumble, who <laughs> he was just such fun to write. He's, he's a street entertainer, but he, he, he's a he's just a pisshead basically. Um, and I thought, yeah, he's going to come back, and he is, and he's but he's back in um, book, book six. Yeah. The I I I think I mean the advice I'll give for any writer is. Any character, the way I approach it, any character on a page, unless they are literally just coming in to drop off an envelope with a bit of paper or something, mm. should better carry a story on their own mm. in your in your mind, as in you know enough about them so that you, they could actually go out and, and, and do something fairly interesting themselves. So mm. once you've got that, then and if you flesh them out a little bit, and it doesn't have to be a great deal, then they actually people readers will remember them if you do happen to bring them back. Yeah. yeah so I mean, you're quite right. I mean. Characters who don't play a big role in one book. Um, if you're if you're doing a series book and you're doing it quite well, you do end up with a whole cast that you can that you can draw on in in later books. That's yeah. a good question. I've, I've never I've never really thought about it to be honest. Yeah, it's a great mm. question. I mean, do you would you ever plan it like in a series, for example, to think okay, this character is you know when the characters intertwine throughout the series, are you ever planning for that to happen down the line, or are you doing book by book? No, I'm, I'm planning it. Um, down the line so mm -hmm. i introduced a um plot point in book one which won't resolve till book eight wow. and i introduced a character in one of the earlier books who um poe may or may not end up in a relationship with um which may or may not go well <laughs> um <laughs> Without saying too much, so I'm always thinking that, um, which is why you've got you've got to give your characters a bit of um, a bit of a backstory, even if it's only you that knows it. Um, so yeah, I, because I, I, I'm always thinking there. I'm, I'm always thinking who who might be, fit. and also it's a bit lazy actually. It, the more characters you have to call on, the less invention you have to do in later books, mm. um, which is a, a sort of ridiculous way of thinking. That. I mean, it's quite true. Mm. Fantastic. So I was going to ask just before we go. Obviously, you include short stories at the, the you know, and you talked about the um, exclusive cover at the start with the short story in the front. It, is that something that you enjoy constantly writing the short stories? And what are the what are the differences between writing a short story and writing a novel, and the challenges that they they present? Uh, I, I don't know if I enjoy short stories because I'm not a natural short storyteller. The short story mm -hmm. I'm writing now, which we're talking about just before we came on air. Is like nine thousand words, so it's not it's not the shortest short story. You know? I mean, it's about an eighth of a novel. Um, the, the the challenges are obvious. I mean, you've only got so much. You you, you don't have the luxury of, of um, fleshing too many things out. I always try and get a bit of a plot going on, but I always make them lighter in tone. Um, mm. so the more comedic, um, the, the 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 things you 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 sort of a bit of um, the bit of brevity at the end of. Mm. The novels. I think I've written about eight now in in, in, mm. in total, and they're all, they're all quite quite amusing. I mean, some of them deal with dark. I mean, one of them dealt with them um, two guys being hogtied and stuck inside a cow carcass, and then put inside a foot and mouth burial pit. I mean, that wasn't um, sort of play school reading, but mm. there was some quite funny stuff before and after. Well, I thought. Mm. Anyway, um, <laughs> but yeah, you can you can deal with some quite serious things. I mean, I mean, some of it um, you, you'll you'll get ideas, or you'll 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 see something and think, "Well, oh, that's a great idea," but it's not enough for a, a novel. Mm. That's a short story idea. That um, mm. and well, I'll put it in my file. When it comes to writing a short story, I'll, I'll just I'll, I'll I'll think right. I'll I'll, I'll work on that one, and I'll I'll, I'll see how that goes. But I try not to spend more than two weeks on a short story anyway. Yeah, I appreciate yeah. We're, we're pushing time here, but obviously short stories is something not many people um, may have experienced. And when you write a short story, do you look at publishing that, for example, or, or is it, got, you know, do you self-publish that? And if so, how do you work about kind of pricing it, for example? I, I, I have never written a speculative short story. Every short story I've written has been is because I've been asked mm. to write a short story. Mm -hmm. Um, the first one I wrote, my editor actually just said, look, there's a BBC competition. Got, have you got any short stories ready to go? I said, I haven't. Mm. I can write one. 
Uh, this was a Friday afternoon, and she, and I said, "When's it due?" And she said, nine o'clock Monday morning." So I was. Oh, <laughs> Um, so I wrote that, and then they said, right, we're going to release it for 99p later in the year. Mm. And I said, why don't I write a few more? Then you could out mm. the collection, you could like charge 199 for it, which is still quite affordable, but then the, the reader's getting something that can actually sink the teeth into. And then a lot of the others have been in anthologies um, that I've been asked to write or in the back of. So I wrote a Christmas story for the back of the Tesco edition of The Creator, uh, that was something that they wanted, and the Waterstones um, special edition, they wanted a, a short story relevant to Waterstones, so I actually set it in a Waterstones, which right. was a lazy right. way to do that. But, so, yeah, I, 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 I would, a lot of people do. A lot of people enjoy writing short stories. I'm not mm. massively one of them. Mm. Um, mm. I'll, I'll sort of do it as a task rather than something I, I massively enjoy. But then again, you, you sometimes find a funny line and you, you do enjoy it. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. Uh, Mike, all we can say is thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Honestly, it's been oh, yeah. a, a wonderful show. Oh, yeah. uh, before we do go, where can people find more about you? Where can they buy your books from? Uh, you can buy my books anywhere that sells books. That's quite an easy one. And my <laughs> website, mwcraven.com, is hopefully out of date, but I'll occasionally have <laughs> some shameless self-promotion on there. Twitter is probably where I'm most active, so mwcravenuk on Twitter. So that's where I, I'm at my most exorbitant absolutely fantastic chris anything else from you no just obviously we've got another great show on friday so please join us there and thank you again so much mike for coming on it's been an absolute pleasure chatting to you thank you, thank you for having me. awesome guys uh thank you so much again look after yourselves we'll see you friday next week the panel shows here for the first time uh very exciting please tune in please uh be part of that and uh look after yourselves we'll see you on friday bye guys